Oh, yeah, 45 degrees. 45 degrees, oh my god. Yes. Yeah. Yes. And you see, 45 degrees, my yeah. god. What is the temperature? I have not checked Good Mumbai here, and let me check Mumbai. <laughs> Mumbai you know, temperature will be not bad here. Yeah. Wow. It will be like Calcutta. Oh, <laughs> a nice one. <laughs> It's, it's immediately wet inside. So, uh, yeah. In that condition, next hours, sometimes it's six hours. So, we are waiting for somebody or we are starting? Yeah, we are starting. We are starting in two minutes. I'm just putting live on YouTube. So, today's Mumbai temperature is 33, 33 degrees Celsius. I mean, it should become 45, Roshan. Then the virus will die. <laughs> <laughs> so, I think we are just live on YouTube. Can you see the YouTube icon in your... Uh... Yes. yes, you can see that. Yeah. yeah. So, I'll request uh, the moderators. I'll just start the program. i designated. And we will start the meeting now. And once it is on YouTube, we'll, uh, I'll be reading the questions for uh, all the panelists, as well as we're going to have the case-based discussion from Dr. Samir. So for today, we have uh, two uh, moderators, that is Dr. Vivek Pandey, Dr. Kalpesh Trivedi. Vivek is going to join later because he's busy in some work, personal work. Uh, all the three lectures are by Dr. Roman, who uh, happily agreed to give a talk. Uh, I met Roman many years back at Dr. Laura Lafo's uh, meeting, and since then we, we become a very good friend. Uh, Laura told me he is one of one of his best fellow he could ever had, and he is a wonderful surgeon. In fact, I saw Roman performing live arthroscopic lethargy surgery in NAC, and I was amazed to see his skills. Uh, and, uh, that uh, you know, since that time I started knowing him as a wonderful shoulder surgeon, over which he is a wonderful human being. If you know him, he, uh, he can get easily uh, friendly with any of the uh, surgeons without any ego. So, there he is, Roman. Then we have the panelists to discuss the cases uh, Dr. N. Subramaniam, he is a, a surgeon from South India, Chennai, Madurai, Subra. Hi. Then we have Dr. Rajiv Raman uh, and we have Dr. Kalpesh Trivedi who is going to moderate the session and we will be joined by a few of the uh, more members as we proceed. Dr. Abhay, can you listen to me? Dr. Abhay Narvekar is there. He is a senior most uh, shoulder surgeon from Mumbai. Dr. Abhay Narvekar. I'm there. I'm there, but I'll have to go after some time. Okay, okay, no problem. It's a meeting. Yeah, you can you can continue. So I'll request yeah. Dr. Kalpesh to go ahead with the thing. We are already live on YouTube. Kalpesh. Yes. Uh, uh, good afternoon, uh, Dr. Roman, and welcome to Arthroscopy Study Group of India. And uh, today's webinar is the topic is bony instability of shoulder. And uh, I would request you to share your screen and the first, to continue with your first lecture. Bony instability, clinical and radiological assessment. Roman, you can share your screen so that I can mute everyone. Yes, I do. I hope you, you can see this. Screen. Yes, yes. Yes, yes, we can see. Cool. Uh, so I, I would like to... Roman, unmute yourself. Yeah, yeah, he's unmuted. I'm on mute? Yeah, yeah, no problem. We can go ahead. We can hear you, we can see you. Okay, perfect. So, uh, just let me to say a few words about uh, my activity. This is my hospital in my city, and this is the, the ambience which we had before the COVID. Uh, now, it looks a little bit more sad. Everything is covered. Uh, we have a special uh, room for the patients suspected to the COVID. Uh, everybody are hiding behind the uh, glass walls. And this is the uh, amount of uh, intervention which we does uh, in uh, April this year, according to April last year. So it goes really down and this is the full activity. So we almost completely break down in the uh, end of the uh, uh, March and beginning of April. Mm -hmm. 
Now it's uh, beginning uh, to start actually. We restart our elective surgery since two weeks, but we are here to speak about something which is important in our daily practice, about that. This is the glenoid uh, bone uh, fracture, actually glenoid bone loss. And this is uh, the main factor for me to decide uh, which kind of surgery to apply for my patient. Uh, watching the, the screen, intra uh, articular screen, we have to focus actually almost always bilateral damage as well on the glenoid side and the humeral side. Uh, speaking about the glenoid side, um, I distinguish this small red line as a limit of my soft tissue intervention. Uh, of course, there is a huge science behind and there is a lot of scientists working on over what, to, uh, what, what can we add actually to, to measure and to make it practically for our daily practice. Uh, first of all, we have to distinguish in between two groups. We have a fresh glenoid bone fracture and we have a, something which is not really fresh, something which is a little bit inveterate like after three, four dislocations, but also we have something really uh, looks like erosion of the glenoid. And this is uh, the, the main problem, main issue, because not always we can treat these kind of patients with the uh, typical techniques, uh, uh, also using the, the bony techniques. Uh, how, to, how to measure it uh, and what is important? The importance is what do we have in our hospitals, in our practice? What can we uh, diagnose actually? Uh, I start from the CT scan and on the CT scan, it was very nicely uh, described by uh, A.G. Toy, how to measure and how important is the, the bony loss uh, on the glenoid rim. Uh, but you have to have a CT scan. Not all of us has uh, access to CT scan, not all in all of the world. Fortunately, we have it, but also we have a uh, MRI. And I spend a lot of time to compare the images coming from the city and I compare it with the MRI. On the city, we can quite easily count, especially we, we can adjust this counting, uh, our measurement to the uh, shape of the glenoid because it's important uh, according the uh, retroversion or antiversion of the, of the uh, glenoid. And Magrelli <clears throat> shown us as well that we don't need actually 3D uh, methods to, uh, to, to, to measure, to distinguish it, because it's comparable. And both, both methods, 2D and 3D, are reliable. So there is no difference, actually. We can use the classical uh, two-dimensional uh, images from the, from the CT scan. Uh, <clears throat> Sugaya uh, introduced uh, this nice method to measure uh, glenoid bone loss uh, using the two circles method, actually. And this was the, the, actually the uh, base, uh, what we use for our Latage study with the whole group. Uh, it was the 10 uh, surgeons uh, participating in the study group. Uh, we start to measure in the a, in a Sugaya method. Uh, and then we compare our, our methods outcomes uh, after the Latage procedure. What is uh, interesting in this method, in this method, uh, we almost always can distinguish in between the big circle and the small circle, uh, IREA, which actually it's the most uh, um, reproducible to count the, uh, the bony loss uh, on the inferior circle. What is important? Because we always adjust the superior circle on the superior tubercle insertion of the biceps, and it is something stable. If you compare both healthy and injured shoulder, very precisely, you can define the superior part of the uh, superior circle. Uh, this gives us the ability to place inferior circle in very precise method. That's why I like the Sugaya uh, method and the morphology of the glenoid. Uh, it's very nicely described by this, uh, this way, on this way. Uh, also, Proventure introduced uh, uh, his measurement, the uh, uh, percentage of the area which, which we lost. Uh, I, I like math. Uh, I was not a good student uh, according to math, but uh, every time we, we, 
when we can count something, it's good. And that's why uh, the ProVenture method uh, is also very reliable and we are trying to use it for the, each patient uh, when we have a CT scan. It's not possible to measure it precisely with the MRI. And this was the uh, subject of our study. We cannot precisely measure in a 2D uh, dimension in a MRI. There is a one paper from 2017 shows that uh, the uh, outcome is very similar in between the CT scan and the, and the MRI, but we didn't prove it. For us in our study, unfortunately, uh, the uh, false in the MRI method, uh, uh, the percentage was very, very high. But what to do when we do not have the CT scan or MRI or of all of this sophisticated method, not in our hospital, they are. Philip Hardy, He's shown us that there is a very uh, smart method. Uh, it's a DA ratio. It means um, it's comparison between the diameter of the heel sacs and the uh, volume of the, of the glenoid. And if you have a very good radiologist who can uh, perform in very reproducible way uh, <clears throat> this uh, classical X-ray uh, in a Bernajo profile. Bernajo profile, it's a profile when we uh, put the lamp under the uh, axillary pouch. Um, the really experienced radiologist can uh, make a very comparable uh, pictures and then we can count it and it's very easy. And this hardest method was used in our hospital for many years actually. Now we are, we are going to uh, discuss about the uh, Yamamoto concept of the on-track, off-track. Of course, it's not possible to measure it in a classical uh, X-rays, forget it. So the, the Yamamoto concept uh, was to uh, define the uh, percentage of the glenoid surface, uh, which we have to have in the contact with the humeral head to keep the humeral head uh, actually in a position on-track. Every time when we have a, a bigger uh, loss, bone loss, then uh, preserve the 84% of the glenoid surface, we have an off-track lesion. However, there is a big difference in between the in, uh, head diameter uh, described by Hardy, which uh, put the, this limit line uh, over the 16%, uh, and Minyachi. Minyachi uh, define it that the critical uh, bone loss, it's uh, more than 25%. So why it's so big different? This is uh, quite difficult to understand it. And it's important because if we uh, watch on the clinical uh, aspect of the glenoid bone loss, we have to have some critical line, some thin red line to adjust for which patients can we still do the arthroscopic soft tissue procedure quite critical decision. We know how big ratio of the uh, redislocation uh, are after the uh, classical bunker repair. What to do when we have a glenoid fracture less than 20%. And this is at least a majority of the decision uh, making problems. Because if there is an engaging heel sacs, so it means it's off track it means that we have to add some augmentation for the classical bunker procedure. It will not uh, be enough to, uh, to hold the, the joint in stability if we just uh, use the soft tissue procedure on the anterior rib. That's why this kind of uh, uh, lesion we put into the group uh, with the bony procedure, uh, as well as a group with a, some kind of augmentation. And in the, my last topic, I will tell you something about this uh, augmentations. If we have a severe glenoid uh, defect, uh, it means it's for sure off track, uh, but sometimes it could be on track. How to measure it? Without the uh, introducing the term hyperlaxity, we cannot understand it. Some of the patients, they can be stable mathematically, not possible, but in reality, they are on track, even if they have a severe glenoid defect. Sometimes we, we take the decision, we, we put this group of the patients immediately to the bony group. But imagine some of these patients are not very young, not very sportive, they are not hyperlax, 
and they don't need actually to use the arm in a uh, position able. What it means, maybe this is uh, some debatable group when we can use also the augmentation uh, making our decision. And we have uh, several uh, surgical options uh, to, to treat this, this group of patients, but the recurrence rates are quite uh, high. And the, in the literature, in all meta-analysis, we cannot find the group uh, less than 30% according to the soft tissue procedure isolated. Uh, we have that, uh, this data that the Latage is very reliable and very stable. Uh, method to treat these patients and then bone block as well. However, uh, there are some new papers showing that the, the bone block gives the stability, uh, avoiding the uh, dislocation, but they, they, they cannot um, avoid the anterior translation of the humeral head, which is connected, of course, uh, immediately with the uh, early of the arthritis problem. Uh, that's why this concept, engaging and non-engaging heel sucks lesion, we should take into the consideration. And having this in mind, uh, we have to immediately ask ourselves for which patients and which location of the heel sucks we can apply the soft tissue and for which bony procedure. This critical line, it's the obliquity of the heel sucks. It's very, uh, commonly known that uh, this line decide in which patients, in which direction we will have a dislocation. But also we have to take into the con the depth and a location according to the superior inferior aspect of the humeral head. Uh, what, is the, what is the outcome of all of this? Uh, most of the patients with uh, severe glenoid bone loss I treat with the uh, bony procedure and in, in between them majority the primary cases uh, uh, latage procedure for the patients uh, for whom latage fail I use the bone block and I augment this bone block with the subscapularis tendon uh, this is a technique which actually we, we are still developing we are working with a group of uh, Italian surgeons uh, and we have some nicely looking uh, early uh, outcome after this procedure, but we know that uh, speaking about the uh, instability treatment, we have to have follow up at least 10 years. Uh, I was waiting with the publication of my BLS technique uh, up to 10 years. And I can tell you and I can assure you that it was not enough. I observe, I follow these patients, this group of these patients, and I still had uh, some patients which came back with the uh, uh, radius locations. So I think that to, uh, to, to create actually reliable methods, we have to wait even 15 years. Maybe it's uh, something which is uncommon, maybe it's too much, but uh, this is the outcome of my practice actually. And what is, what is, uh, 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 now important, uh, what we're trying to focus to take a decision for the first dislocators. Uh, because the glenoid bone loss, uh, it's clearly visible. Guala has shown us that 82% of the patients after the first dislocation, they have a bone defects. These bony defects, especially heel sacs fracture uh, in the first dislocators, uh, they have a very uh, different presence. When we have the location of the uh, heel sucks lesion, as uh, the Giacomo uh, described, uh, on the superior part of the uh, humeral head, then after the first dislocation, we can be sure that in a group younger than 25 years, we will have a 90% of rate dislocation rate. That's why it's important. And that's why. Uh, not only location, but also the depth and the size of the heel sacs is important. Especially when we have a first time dislocator and we have a, this three of eight part of the humeral head lost, we can be sure that the dislocation rate will be almost 100% in the group of the young patients. So 100%, it's nothing what we can treat with the soft tissue procedure, even without the glenoid bone loss. So 
take it into, into the con consideration and then uh, we have to find some solution. I'm not a guy who is uh, uh, a big fan to grafting the humeral head. I prefer to reconstruct the anterior structures and even if the glenoid is not injured, I will add the Latage procedure because of the active sling effect. And in these cases, I'm smoothing very much the graft to do not enlarge the, the volume of the glenoid but I still preserve the uh, subscap connection with the conjunct tendon. And this is my way to treat the huge heel sac fracture. I spoke with a Christian Gerber a few years ago uh, about the uh, uh, grafting the humeral head. He did probably majority of the, uh, of the operation which was described in the literature was, was done by him. And he followed these patients 25 years one of the longest group patients with the, such a uh, nice follow-up. And he said, Roman, half, half, half of them de develop the early arthritis, half of them are doing perfect. After the Latage procedure, 96% of the patients are doing well. And early arthritis is something we can discuss, of course, they will develop 34% of all patients uh, treated by uh, arthro latage or uh, open latage, it doesn't matter. They will develop the early arthritis. This is the natural part of the history of this location. But half, half, 50%, it's a little bit too much for me. So that's why I never uh, went into the uh, uh, grafting of the humeral head. Uh, this is the last slide, and this is the uh, slide of uh, Philip Hardy, uh, this measurement. Uh, why I'm, I like this slide, because it was actually something which gives me the understanding uh, how to verify for which patients, for whom I supposed to uh, add the uh, bony procedure, even if I have a quite nicely preserved glenoid, like in here and here. This patient has a deep heel sac lesion, and this deep heel sac lesion is visible in the normal X-ray. It's not really nicely done uh, x-ray because we cannot see the the, uh, uh, the surface of the uh, of the glenite um, precisely but still we can see the heel sac lesion in the ap view always when we have the this kind of heel sac lesion it means that it's the upper part of the humeral head which is injured and that's why in the ic score pascal boileau used this uh, parameter as an influencing factor. Visible heel sacs lesion in the AP view, it means it's a deep heel sacs located on the superior part of the, the humeral head. It's commonly known, but it's important. Personally, I perform for all my patients, especially after the failure of the primary surgery, especially after the failure of the bank art repair, I do the uh, MRI. I'm stopped to do the uh, Arthro MRI. I did it for two years. It was a big mess because the uh, radiologist always called me in the middle of my outpatient clinic. It's calm because we, we are not inside. We cannot verify if the, the liquid is outside the joint, inside the joint. That was the painful. And finally, we compare our decision between the two groups with the Arthro MRI, without the uh, Arthro MRI, just a simple MRI. No, no difference. So to make a decision for me now, it's just enough to uh, see the MRI. Pre-op MRI decides actually, uh, of course, uh, regarding the, the uh, all other parameters like age, activities, uh, laxity, uh, number of dislocation, uh, so on. But still, MRI is my major uh, goal. So thank you for this. Uh, short presentation and um, I would like to thank you for invitation first of all and now it's a time for discussion I think. Yes Roman uh, excellent talk uh, and insight of a humeral side and linear side bone loss. Uh, Roshan any question on YouTube or what is Yeah, this? Yeah I'm just checking on YouTube. Roman, I have a question. What method you use in your clinical practice as more predictive 
for diagnosing the bone loss the most uh, like you have a patient 25 year old male who comes to your uh, consulting room so uh, with the, with the uh, glenoid and humeral bone loss what first uh, what clinical method you use to diagnose that this patient is going to require arthrolatage he is going to require latage he is going to require always like at first uh, i'm asking for the classical x ray uh, why the classical x ray is something which gives me uh, at least a few important information the first do we have a fracture if we have really fracture important fracture it will be visible in a classical x ray the anterior rim of the glenoid is broken you cannot see this flat line uh, black, uh, white line like was described uh, in the literature. There is a breakage in the Sorry, interstate. Do we have a fracture? If we have, we have I, I know that we have some delay with the sound, so I, I will try to speak uh, maybe slowly and with the, the bigger uh, break in between the phrases. But still, in a normal common X-ray, we can see also the other information. Do we have a fracture of the uh, humeral head? Because not only heel sucks fracture can be uh, found in, in an X-ray, but also the greater tuberosity fracture, the malformation in the greater tuberosity, which is very important. And also, we are still the orthopedic surgeons. We have to think somewhere, some, all of the time, that some of these patients can have some concomitant, problems, yeah, 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 yeah. Con concomitant uh, lesions or even uh, cancers. So the X-ray is something minimum, which I have to have in my uh, the first consultation with the patients. Then I examine the patient. I, verify the apprehension, I verify the statement of the muscles, neurology, uh, motion of the scapula, and then if the patient is active, the patient uh, is working in the hand, uh, working in the overhead position, he is a sportive, then of course I, I, add, I ask to bring some uh, other uh, examination. In Poland, it's quite difficult to ask patients to, uh, to bring a CT scan and MRI as well. So I have to choose. If the patient is 35, I can expect that he can have some additional injuries, some concomitant lesion in a calf, for instance, or insertion of the biceps, very common. In, if uh, during the clinical examination, I have any suspicions that there is some pain during the examination, I always order uh, MRI. Otherwise, if he is completely pain-free, he's, he's just a dislocator, I will ask for CT scan. Why? Because on the CT scan, very precisely, 35, still this age is something which is uh, important as well. Uh, in 35, if he's not uh, very active, if he has have still some uh, fragment of the bone, and this fragment is enough big to be reattached then I always think that this is the fracture, we have to fix it. And sometimes this group of the patients don't need the latage procedure. Sometimes they need the just reconstruction of the glenoid and we can put nicely if it's still present. If we have a still present uh, uh, labrum, we can put over this fragment and then we have some kind of support. I think it's, it's a good solution. So that's why I, I will ask for this kind of patients, uh, pain-free patients, I will ask for CT scan. Uh, there is a question in YouTube from Dr. Mukesh Ladda. He wants to know, can you explain more about hill sacs, the position of hill sacs and its association with recurrence dislocation in younger patients? Mm -hmm. Imagine in majority position, the dislocation occurs when the arm is in that position. It's an upper position, abduction, external rotation. In this position, superior part of the humeral head attacked the glenoid rim in an in, uh, anterior inferior position. And this is the typical classical position for the arm dislocation. If the heel sucks 
is located very vertically, it's not on the superior part of the humeral head, then the dislocation is supposed to occur in that position with the elbow connected with the, with the body. So it's very uncommon position for the dislocation. In that position, this fracture hides and it's not contacted with the anterior inferior glenoid ring. So that's why the position superior uh, aspect of the humeral head is very dangerous. Uh, Roman, you have been trained with Laura Lafosse for many years. You're a very good friend of him. And a few weeks back, we had, we had Laura Lafosse for a similar seminar. And we asked him, what is the best methodology to calculate the bone loss on glenoid and humeral side? And his question was, uh, I can't analyze the uh, three-dimensional uh, joint with two-dimensional investigations. It's very difficult to analyze the glenoid and humeral bone loss only on 2D. He says the uh, Sugaya method, the Griffith method, the uh, Steve Bacart method, all the methods are in two-dimensional and glenohumeral instability is three-dimensional. He could not explain how, how is one can quantify the bone loss, but is there any 3D methods which can be used to quantifying bone, bone loss? Because the off-track, on-track technique is a little bit more confusing. And not that every radiologist is uh, great enough to understand this uh, off-track, on-track concept. So do you have something extra to understand this three-dimensional instability, Roman? Yeah, that's why, that's why there is so many uh, confusing uh, and different methods uh, uh, trying to uh, answer this question. The problem is that if we compare two patients, the group of the patients which are not laxed and the patients which are hyperlaxed, we are trying to compare apples and pears. Not possible. Very often, the people over 30, like 40, 45 even, they have a huge bony defects and they are stable. It means we can count, we can compare all the methods. We can try to even uh, uh, build the model, which was done by one of my fellow. He built a model of, for each shoulder in a 3D printer to count uh, the, the all angulations. Uh, and he tried to explain uh, which patients is more predicted for the uh, uh, redislocations. The problem is that only radiological investigation, it's not sufficient, it's not enough for the patients which have a completely different stability of the joint. And in some patients, they can have a, not even 75% uh, according to the, the Giacomo uh, uh, on track, uh, off track concept. And they are completely stable. They have a dislocations when they are trying to hide for something uh, under the table, for instance. Untypical, but it's also the location of the heel sacs uh, uh, which uh, actually uh, define this kind of dislocation. I cannot say that there is a, an ideal three dimensional method to call the on track, off track uh, uh, situation. Doesn't exist. In my opinion, it doesn't exist. And without this clear comparison in between the laxity and the uh, glenoid uh, and the humeral bone loss. We cannot move forward. It's, it will be just uh, the, the, the play. Anybody, uh, Rama, Rajiv, do you have any question? Roman, uh, how do you measure double hill sex? Sometimes you have a rim compression fracture also. So how do you measure this double hill sex? The problem is that uh, the patients demonstrate very often kind of subluxations are not dislocation but subluxation it means it engaged this first heel sacs lesion and in majority cases it's the cartilage lesion so if there is a only cartilage lesion i do not count it like a heel sacs lesion why because we can treat it during the operation we can put some kind of membrane hyalophast whatever and it works if the joint is stable so real dislocation appear when we have the engagement of the real heel sacs on the anterior glenoid tree. 
And this is what we, we are trying to, to treat. If, of course, if it's a huge cartilage damage, this kind of shoulder is supposed to be treated by the uh, resurfacing. You cannot uh, replace a half of the uh, surface of the, of the humeral head with the hyalophas or, or anything else, because then uh, it will be destroyed after the first movement. But the small one, like uh, seven, eight millimeters, easily, uh, we can we can refix with the uh, with a with a membrane. So, uh, Roman, uh, uh, from your talk, uh, should we derive the conclusion that if the Hilsec lesion is visible on an AP view in internal rotation, that means this patient demands bony reconstruction. That's yeah. for sure, irrespective of the glenoid uh, bone loss. Of course, it's uh, adequate for this statement of the uh, uh, laxity of the patients. If the patient uh, is unstable, if he has an apprehension test in the 90 degrees, 140 degrees, for sure, uh, we have to take it into consideration. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So, I so think... uh, Samir, do you have any question for Boni? Samir, can you hear us? Subra? Yeah, if there are no questions, then we'll... Uh, I, I think, Subra, we can't, we can't hear no, you. Just, Roman, uh, uh, hi. Yeah. Uh, Roman, just one question. Uh, how is your management pattern in those who are having a small defect, like around 10% or even less than 10% through our contact athletes? Mm -hmm. You go for a arthroscopic repair, you go for a bony procedure, how do you do that? I mean, I'm talking about a young person, 20-year-old, with uh, bony defect, which is around only less than 10%, mm -hmm. but he's a contact athlete, also professional athlete. Would he still go for arthroscopic uh, soft tissue repair or would he go for a uh, catarji? Tell me, what about the heel sucks? Mm -hmm. Hello? Yeah? Do he have a heel sucks lesion? So, sorry, I can't hear you. Say that again. Subra. He is telling that where patient has a hill sack lesion present hill or, or not? No, no hill, hill sack is a small hill sack. Small hill sack. Small okay. hill sack, yeah. Then I will, I will answer very uh, practically your question uh, during my last talk because uh, I separate the patients in between four groups and uh, one of these groups is exactly this kind of patient. Uh, I'm trying to treat the professional throwing atlas, athletes with the bone loss no matter which size, and the present heel sucks with a latage procedure. Except the patient with a fresh glenoid fracture. If it's not inveterate, if it's fresh, I will just fix the, the labrum together with the bony fragment on the Sugaya method, and it works. But these patients with the heel sucks lesion, Professional throwing athletes, we have to distinguish in between the professional rugby player and the volleyball player, tennis player and the football player. In this case, I will I will go for, for the latter throwing athletes. Latter. So, so the thing is, um, anyone contact athlete, they have a very high chance of recurrence if you do the soft tissue procedure. Isn't it? So that's the reason you go for a tatatio procedure. Is that, is, that, is that what you mean? For each patient with a bilateral bone loss, throwing outlets with the inveterate glenoid fracture, I will go for the latter's procedure. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. There is a question in YouTube, uh, Ramon. This is from again Dr. Mukesh Ladda. He's asking the medial location oh, okay. of hill sacks with shallow depth and lateral location of hill sacks with huge depth, which is more dangerous, whether it's a medial location of hill sacks or lateral location of the hill sacks? Yeah, middle, middle location of the hill sacks. Oh, uh, 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 I already, already told it that if it's in the, in the middle of the humeral head, in majority cases, it's a, a cartilage fracture, and then we can treat it. When we stabilize the joint, it will heal. If it's a very lateral heel sacs, it means it's a heel sacs which occurred during the real dislocation. 
and then we follow the uh, condition of real dislocation. So it doesn't yeah. change actually uh, anything except our approach for the treating the cartilage. I think if there is no question, we'll proceed on to his next talk, managing glenoid bone loss. Is it right, Kalpesh? Managing yes. glenoid bone loss. Management yes. of yes. glenoid bone loss. Yeah. Yeah. Roman, you can uh, share your screen. Share your screen. Yeah, so I'll mute everyone, Roman. Can you can you see the first? Good. So I'm, I'm yeah, just we can going. hear you, we can see you. No problem. Go ahead. Good, perfect. Uh, so let's start. Let's start the second talk. Uh, it's about the surgical treatment option. I start from the same uh, picture which you already seen, uh, according to the recurrence. Uh, this is uh, actually my most important uh, predictable factor for the uh, management of the glenoid bone loss. Uh, maybe you you heard about it, but I spent a at least uh, 10 years to work on over the uh, augmentation methods, uh, how to prove our stability using the soft tissue procedure. Uh, I described it as a, as a BLS, it will be the next talk. Uh, there is a limit, this, there is a clear limit uh, which I introduce in my practice. Every time when I see the straight line on the glenoid, it means the glenoid bone loss, it's at least 20% or maybe more, maybe less, but it's a straight line or an, on anterior glenoid uh, rim. It means this is the borderline and you will see why. For all of these patients, I use the uh, actually bony procedure. Every time, whenever it's possible, I'm using the Latage procedure because I'm strongly believing in the biomechanic effect of this method. And this is the, the beginning, a few slides from the history. It's 2004, and we start to work with these two nice gentlemen, you know all of them. Uh, and it was 2004, we actually start to work uh, on over the atrial Latage procedure. So my, my practice actually, before I came to France, I did maybe 20 uh, open latage procedure, not much. And since I came back from, from uh, Annecy, uh, since Lauren did the first latage procedure, this is the picture from this uh, uh, procedure, this is the, uh, Etienne Lejeune, uh, my friends from Belgium. Uh, he did it in 2007. And since this period, we are doing actually only latage uh, acroscopically. And this is the current situation. It was before the COVID, of course, we are not wearing the, the funny masks, but uh, this is my setup. And then uh, we are trying to prove uh, if everything what we, we've done uh, till this moment, it was uh, actually uh, valuable or, or really not, if it brings something to world or, or not really. And that's why we create the the group, uh, actually it was the idea of Gilles Valch and, and Laurent uh, take care on it. Uh, and he grouped the people doing the Latage procedure. And we this, did this study, uh, it was published two years ago. And in this study, uh, we've, we proved that the position of the graft uh, using the uh, Arthur Latage method uh, could be very precise. On the beginning, the uh, uh, learning curve was quite uh, disappointing. And we have, to, we have to confess that on the beginning, the positioning of the graph was bad, was worse than in the open surgery. But after, uh, let's say, I cannot say exactly now, was approximately one and a half year of the uh, uh, learning curve of each of five uh, surgeons participating in the study. Uh, it means it was more than 25 uh, cases. The position of the graft uh, was perfect. So the, the learning curve, it's very steep. 
But when you reach the right method, right step-by-step, uh, uh, -step, uh, let's say, uh, uh, predictable procedure, then the position of your graft, it more or less almost in the same place. And it's funny because in, in the open surgery, it doesn't look like that. Uh, so let's say about the uh, uh, arthroscopic lethargy. If you have a, a, any problem with the movie, uh, just please tell me because I don't know if, if it goes smoothly. It's quite heavy movie. But this is the uh, recurrent dislocation with very untypical for the uh, arterial latage procedure. Why? Because in this case, there was no capsule. In this case, uh, uh, I, can, I can just remove all the remnants of the something what, which was capsule previously. And we can see that inside the uh, uh, subscapularis muscle and uh, insertion of the subscap, there is a lot of tendinous cords. These are the tendons inside the muscle. And discovering these tendons allows us to place very precisely the level of the split, which is invisible from the outside when we are doing an open surgery lateral procedure. Then the all preparation of the conjunct tendon, it's also much more precise than uh, what we can achieve uh, in an open surgery. You see the, the remnants of the threads uh, in the conjunct tendon uh, and as well on the glenoid tree. The second advantage is that we can prepare the glenoid surface, the, uh, <laughs> the neck of the scapula, using the superior portal. It's not reachable in an open surgery because we are working in front of our face. Latage arthroscopically introduced this new ability to perform the very adequate surface on the glenoid uh, uh, rim or neck of the scapula. And this was uh, the step which takes uh, probably the, the longest time uh, to discover that we can really easily prepare, uh, and precisely prepare uh, the glenoid rim. The uh, preparation of the uh, coracoid process. This is the second step which makes this procedure much more safe in, in uh, my opinion, uh, I know it's uh, very debatable, but the preparation of the coracoid process with the, all of this visualization of the musculocutaneous nerve, uh, the preparation up to the CC ligaments and the very precise positioning of the, uh, the holes, this is a um, crucial step to uh, avoid the problems what we have uh, on the beginning. It means the malpositioning of the screws and protrusion of the screws into the glenoid, uh, into the humerals uh, after the operation. These steps uh, are very reproducible. You see the space uh, surrounding the coracoid process. It's not a high pressure. It's just the preparation with the, with the buoy, with the uh, electrocautery, which allows us to keep the bleeding under the control. The patient's pressure is normal. Uh, and then using this uh, uh, chisel to cut the uh, coracoid, it's also some come back to the past because uh, uh, as you probably know, the uh, Pascal Boileau, he, he developed this uh, axilla, uh, uh, oscillating saw for, for the cutting and preparing the uh, coracoid process. I'm still using the chisel. Why? With the chisel, uh, I know precisely where I will cut the surface, uh, under surface of, of the uh, coracoid process. Of course, it will be some small spike without the preparation. Uh, we are prepared for this, but also we introduce some uh, neurosurgical uh, instruments to, to cut it off. Uh, now it's, it, it takes uh, a few minutes to, to prepare actually the uh, under surface of the coracoid process. And all of the uh, liberation from the remnants uh, of the bursa, subcoracoidian bursa, also under the visualization uh, of the scope, it's uh, safe and we don't need to be afraid that, that we will injure the axillary or uh, muscular cutaneous nerve. And the split. You see now the uh, subscap tendon, you see this tendinous cord, which we've seen clearly uh, from inside the joint, and we can distinguish where is actual position uh, in between the 
the superior two third and the one third inferior. Small uh, incision of the uh, movie. This is the uh, version with the switching stick. And now using the switching stick, we just perform the external rotation and blindly separate the subscapularis muscle. This changed a lot because we do not harm, we do not injure the subscap with, a, with the cautery. So it's not burned, it's just split like uh, uh, original technique was described. And then we achieve a very good uh, access for the, uh, for the glenoid. You see now it's bleeding because uh, the, the pressure of the patient is not very low. <clears throat> These are the steps which allows us to, to use the uh, minimal, uh, minimal uh, invasive, let's say, <coughs> anesthesia. Uh, all of the rest, it's just the preparation uh, and building up the, the, the all step-by-step -step procedure uh, using the uh, uh, typical J&J, uh, Steel Johnson uh, and Johnson uh, instrumentation. As you can observe, uh, superior uh, hole, it's not uh, fulfilled with the top head. Uh, we stopped to use the top head uh, because it was bordering the subscapularis. Uh, and now we, use, we are using only the uh, isolated screw for the superior hole and the screw with the top head for the inferior hole. And now I, I will show you some uh, tip uh, how to how to avoid the, uh, the problem, mechanical problem with the preparation of the uh, coracoid process. I punched the uh, coracoid with a key wire to the uh, humeral head, which allows me to uh, keep the coracoid process very stable. Using uh, homemade, uh, let's say, this, this is the pro prototype now it's uh, justified. It's just uh, Langenbeck hook, a little bit shorter than normal. Uh, I elevate the superior part of the subscap and with the switching stick introduced by the uh, posterior portal, I'm lowering the uh, lower part of the subscap and then uh, it allows us to, to uh, pass the coracoid process through the split. The position, the positioning uh, is now very easy with the new instrumentation of the J&J because you can uh, place it uh, uh, in the pre-drilled holes and you can drill it even from posterior. It's a, it's a new way. I'm uh, a bit traditionalist. Uh, I'm pretty satisfied with the uh, drilling from anterior uh, and I do not find uh, any advantage to, to drill it from posterior. However, in some cases, especially with a very huge uh, glenoid bone loss, it, it, may be, it may be more safe if we can uh, pre-drill the holes from the posterior. And now we, we squeeze this, the screws and the, the operation is done. Uh, on the end of the operation, of course, it's quite important to verify if the graph is not too bulky. Uh, always when we verify it uh, with the switching stick introduced posteriorly, we can uh, verify if the, the surface is flash. It's supposed to be flash, but uh, even if it's a, a bit bulky, we can use a bar uh, and we can uh, make it flash, we can polish it. Uh, up to the, the normal level. And that's it, this is the, the technique. Uh, the uh, small uh, surgical gest on the end, like uh, wrapping out the uh, floating part of the cartilage, break cartilage, uh, it just gives a, a smooth motion for the human head, nothing else. Uh, it's not painful as you know. Uh, the superior uh, and the anterior part of the cartilage is it's, uh, not painful even uh, if we have a, this kind of damage of the cartilage. And the position of the nerves, uh, very uh, easy to verify. And the graft is covering, uh, <clears throat> but the nerves are uh, in the danger position. If we leave some connection with the uh, uh, pec minor, uh, that's why uh, I always verify the position of the of the nerves. This is the uh, musculocutaneous nerve, and closer to the uh, inferior part, it's a, a axillary nerve. Some vessels are preserved, as you can see here. The vessels are still there, so they will supply this uh, bony fragment. And uh, I think this is the, the the mystery of the the healing of this. Uh, 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 graft in this method um, and even after two years you can see uh, quite nicely the conjunct tendon still present still working 
uh, still being in place. Uh, this is my assessment. This is my uh, actually management of the of the bony fragment, uh, which uh, sometimes I replace with the free bone graft, especially for the uh, uh, failure uh, after the, the latage procedure. And this is the, the nice group of people which we are working still more or less now uh, during to the pandemia. Uh, we are a little bit limited uh, to travel and work together, but I hope it will it will come back. And uh, this group of people together with Laura uh, and, and his fellows, uh, we are trying to modify, we are trying to adjust this technique to be more friendly for surgeon, to shortening a little bit the uh, uh, learning curve. But still, uh, I think it will it will be in, in permanent progress. So thank you very much. And this is the end of the second topic. So Roman, uh, very elegant demonstration of uh, arthroscopic letter the technique. Thank you. And uh, uh, Roman, yes, yes, Samir. I would like to ask you, Roman, now. Uh, even we are doing lethargy since now 2010, uh, arthroscopic lethargy. Even we have done more than 70 cases now. But now this new uh, technique which has come up with button, now yet, uh, yet it has not been in India. What do you think about that? The using single button, double button, four buttons, whether it is having that bending forces, what we get with this uh, screws? Yeah, I like to have a control. Thank you for this question because it's yeah, it's it's quite a crucial question. I like to have control. I like to follow my patients for uh, many years, and to having control, it's to react. Having the screws inside the joint, it's not pleasant, of course. It's it's risky sometimes, but it's very easy to remove if in any case. If you have a problem, if you have, I, I said to my patients, it's the finger sign. Yeah. I, I never published it, but <laughs> it's the, just the practice. When I put my finger on the scar after the introducing the, the cannula, it means it's the place where the graft is. And I ask the patients to move the arm back and forward, external rotation, uh, internal rotation, if he feel the pain. No matter, it's uh, half a year after the operation, five years after the operation, if you feel the pain, if I heard, I feel some kind of cracking, breathing, and he said, I have a problem, everything is perfect, but I have a problem with the internal rotation, I decide to remove the screws. Because I know I, I have a control on over the subscap. And if the subscap is weak, it means that the screws is bothering the articular surface of the subscap. And this is a necessity to take it out. With the old buttons, all threads, sutures, whatever, plastic screws, I feel I have no control. I don't know if there is a metal which is bothering the subscap or subscap is torn himself, you know that the evaluation of the subscap after the uh, latage procedure or any other procedure using the metal parts, it's very difficult because it's not reliable. There is a lot of artifacts and we don't know if the subscap is injured or not. Every time when I come in to take out the screws, I found the subscap damage. And sometimes it's a very serious subscap damage. If you know that it can occur, if you know the symptoms, then your patients and yourself, you are safe. It's a 15 minutes operation. You put the scope, screws are always in the same place. You have no conjunct tendon, so there is no, no landmarks. So you have to be familiar with the positioning of the subscap, superior border of the subscap. Then you go, uh, through the split, because the, the tissue which are there, they are not normal tissue. You can find, you can verify the split even 10 years after the operation. And then you, you put your, your screwdriver, that's it. Uh, uh, what, what do you think now? Like uh, this endo button uh, is having less osteolysis than your uh, screws or uh, screws are still better? 
Uh, we, we did this uh, comparison with the Pascal uh, Wallow uh, in purpose of our study. And we found that there is a no, actually no difference in between the osteolysis, but the difference is according to the uh, percentage of non-union. And the endobatons gives a more percent of the non-union, it's proven. Screws are, are more solid, it's uh, AO concept. You have uh, two screws, uh, small fragment, no rotation, killing. Roman, uh, you started with the case where you could not see the capsule and there is a, a not great bony defect. In such cases, have you done the subscapularis tenodesis, anterior subscapularis uh, tenodesis procedure along with the uh, maybe uh, a liberal repair. Any any experience on that? Because I think that is also gaining a good momentum where people started doing a subscapularis uh, uh, tenodesis in the liberal repair. Yeah, this is actually the purpose of my next uh, topic. Uh, I'm I'm not using the uh, tenodesis of the subscapular. Okay. Never. I okay. use the partial repair with the part lower part of the subscap. And I strongly believe that uh, there is a limit of using the subscan. If we limit external rotation, we are clearly creating the uh, circumstances to enlarge the osteoarthritis in the joint. Every time when we limit the external rotation more than 20% according the healthy hand, we are create the osteoarthritis. And using the subscap, it's a salvage procedure. Sometimes, of course, I'm totally agreed. Sometimes there is nothing on the anterior wall, nothing. There is a well-shaped glenoid, but no capsule, no labrum, no uh, MGHL. Sometimes there is an inferior glenohumeral ligament preserved, but MGHL doesn't exist. It means there is nothing which can hold the arm. And for me, this is the indication for BLS procedure. This was actually the first cases which I, I do the BLS, uh, I, I did uh, for this kind of cases. But the superior part of the subscap, I never touch. Anyone else? Dr. Dr. Rajiv? Rajiv? Yeah, Roman. So, what is your say on bone desorption? Whether you just to do an arthroscopic letter jet and open letter jet? Is there any difference in bone desorption? Uh, we did a study uh, with the, my colleague uh, from Warsaw, Bartek Kordashevich. He has uh, his own series, 101 cases uh, uh, doing by uh, open and uh, 80 or something uh, uh, doing arthroscopically. He compared both uh, groups and it was a quite big difference uh, between the positioning of the graft. Unfortunately, the position of the graft was worse in the arthroscopic group, <laughs> but it was... Uh, <laughs> a lot of mistakes in the beginning. Uh, there, it was no difference in between the osteolysis at all, but redislocation rate was higher, uh, not much, but it was two cases more in the open group. No statistically uh, significant, but still like that. What is uh, funny that he started, of course, like all of us from the open surgery and after uh, three, three years he started to do it atroscopically. He said that he, he never mentioned that uh, he will never think that this operation could be such easy atroscopically and such difficult in the open way. So this is the question of, of course, of, uh, of experience. This is the question of time. But uh, for sure, all of you, you had a big rugby player on the table or I don't know, the big heavy lifters. Open latage for these guys, it could be nightmare. And nobody will tell. Arthroscopically, we are using the special cannula. We have a, uh, also custom made a, a cannula for the big guys. It's a longer with the longer screws. 
and then there is no difference, no difference in between the uh, operation of the uh, slim guy and the, and the big heavy lifter. So it's changed the changed the world. Yeah, Roman. But in India, what we have come across, like uh, cadaveric study for core acquires, we have done. We have found our core acquires to be a 22 mm or 23 mm, not more than that. For that sake, now we have recommended that you might take people to change the zig. Like the difference between distance between the two screws, which was 8 mm, we have asked them to bring it to 6 mm. Yeah, mm -hmm. th that is a different scenario in India when we are doing the lethargy. You are having a big FC man over there, but here we get a small core acquires for that. Again, for small core acquires to put that zig, what is available now with the depumatic is very difficult. Mm -hmm. Sometimes we go, uh, come across the fracture of that uh, superior screw, what is coming. Mm -hmm. So for that now, we have recommended them to come across that uh, and they are in the process of doing that. Uh, let me tell you, I'm uh, majority, I'm operating the, the male, that's true. But sometimes uh, there are some slim ladies, uh, horse riders and so on, and they have a small coracoid. I never had the problem with the placing the holes and the screws in the smallest coracoid which I offer. The problem was that the strength, the force which you use to screw it, okay. it, it makes a difference because sometimes Coracoid could be very soft. I don't know why. I don't remember if if uh, somebody described it. Uh, I, I don't find it probably in the literature. But sometimes it's very soft, and the breakage of the superior tunnel. I think it's due to the soft coracoid process, not to the diameter of the coracoid, because you you can always define the position of the CC ligament. The CC ligaments, they are exactly on the edge of the uh, knee of the coracoid from the uh, uh, under surface of the coracoid. So if you cut there, you have a distance which is actually at least enough long for two screws. The problem is that sometimes you are trying to reach a little bit more of the coracoid uh, behind the superior screws trying to make your first screw too close to the conjunct tendon. And this is a tricky thing because you have to change the direction of your first cannula, small cannula, and you have to drill in that direction, not from the top like it's in the original technique. I don't know if you see it, if, I, if it's seen like that. This is the coracoid process. And if you, if you are trying to, to drill from here, and you are very, very uh, anterior, you can break the tip of the coracoid. This is the problem. And in these cases with very small coracoid, it's much better to place your cannula in that position, a little bit oblique. And then you do not break the inferior screws and inferior tunnel. And you have some additional place on the strong, a cortical bone on the superior surface of the coracoid. This is the, the trick, how to avoid the breakage uh, of the superior tunnel with a small coracoid. And it's, it's uh, always mandatory to make this obliquity for the small coracoid to do, avoid this problem. Okay, uh, do you yes, have so any other question or we should yeah. go next? One more last question, Roman, uh, sometime in follow-up, while doing the CT scan after one year also, we don't see the bony place. The patient is asymptomatic. The bony union is not there in CT scan. So what do you say for those patients? Asymptomatic, but the bone has not united in CT scan. This is, this is the uh, difficult question. You know why? Because uh, for all of my patients, one year after the operation, systematically, I'm doing the MRI. Uh, now it's habitually, previously was uh, described for, for, uh, for the purpose of our study. Now I'm doing systematically MRI. I'm totally agree that MRI, it's not a tool to verify if we have a non-union or, or, or not. But on MRI, almost always when we have a non-union, we can see, we can find this 
the scar tissue is a fibrocartilage tissue, which is abnormally developed in that area. It means that if we have no union, there is something which, which is trying in nature to hold the graft in the place. It's a nature and it's fibrocartilage tissue. If it's stable, if it's not painful, it will hold for all of the life. The other problem is that the conjunct tendon in the patient, which are with the non-union, it's not visible very often one year after the operation. And this is something which I cannot explain. I have nothing to say about that. We are just investigated. I don't know if it's uh, regardless of the uh, non-union or not. I, I don't know. We probably will make a study, but the group is too small. We have only 4% of uh, problems with the, with the graft and only 1.4% of non-union. So it's very small group. To make a statistical investigation, it's too little. It's just the uh, impression, but I'm strongly, I strongly believe that there is a, some kind of relation between the uh, appearing the conjunct tendon with the stable are disappearing uh, in unstable graft. Okay, I think uh, Roman, we should go ahead with your next stop, that is uh, uh, Hill Sachs, BLS, and Remplissage. Yes, sir. I'm coming. You can, yeah, you can open your presentation, then share the window, same window. And after this, uh, we'll request Samir to discuss few cases with all the panelists so that we can know what is their opinion on, as well as the Indian opinion and the Polish opinion. Mm -hmm. I'll just mute all. Yeah, I'm, I'm in. Uh, I have not much more time because the patient, it's, it's already sleeping. No, no problem. Uh, so I have. They yes, gave we can see you. You can go ahead. No problem. They can. They they gave me ten minutes. So. Okay. No problem. <laughs> it's okay. Uh, so uh, let's talk about the uh, BLS and remplissage. This is the technique uh, which actually uh, I'm still working on, and uh, this is the answer of my question: What to do for this kind of patients? Uh, this is not clearly defined for whom uh, this procedure is supposed to be done. But uh, for me, I had a lot of doubts every time when I have a young people uh, with this relatively small glenoid bone loss, not very active, not professional athletes, uh, what to do for them, uh, go for the latage immediately or, or trying to find something else. Uh, this is the this biggest concern and the main problem. Uh, we know that the, the rate of redislocation uh, are quite high for all this procedure. But there's another question. If we perform the classical bankard repair for this group of patients, uh, what can we expect to find uh, when he, this group of patients will redislocate? And this is very common observation. These are the threats. The uh, glenoid bone loss quite quite large. And uh, we have uh, this kind of uh, uh, humeral uh, cartilage erosion. It's, it's very well known that the, the stability of the shoulder is not only soft tissue, it's, uh, it's not only labrum, it's not only, uh, not only capsule, but in, in majority, in majority, it's a complex. And inside this complex, there is also the, uh, the subscap uh, tendon and the subscap muscle. Again, the same photo. Um, I like this uh, slide because it shows me uh, that sometimes every of us were young. Uh, <clears throat> and uh, also in 2004, uh, I started to work with Lauren um, about the technique which was called Cassiopeia. Cassiopeia was something which uh, uh, was built up to, uh, to find how we can uh, address uh, the soft tissue procedure to replace the bone graft. Actually, that, that was the question. Is it any possibility to fulfill this gap with the soft tissue except to do the latage? And is it possible to achieve something which, give, will, which will give us the sling effect when we uh, use the, the soft tissue here? Well, that was the question. 
And the answer was, uh, can we use the subscap for this? And as you've seen during the uh, latter procedure here, we have this 10 news cord and they are visible in MRI. Uh, we investigate 100 shoulders and in this group, we found that in uh, waste majority uh, in, in the population of, of uh, this group, which we investigate was uh, between uh, five to seven tendinous cord inside the muscle. And what we find also that uh, the muscle, the subscap muscle, uh, in majority of these cases is built from the two separate muscles, let's say. It's like a pec major. We have the sternal and clavicular part. Uh, in here we have the vertical and oblique part. Uh, and this one is the, it's the main goal uh, for our investigation. This is something which we can uh, expect that after the latage procedure, when we put the graft here and, this, uh, and the conjoint tendon there, it will work like a sling effect. What about this part? This is the tendon, this very strong, very uh, robust tendon. And this tendon is used also sometimes in an open procedure. When we cut the capsule, it's very difficult in an open way. I don't know who in between you did a, a <clears throat> open bank art repair. Uh, I was assisting in two of them, one with the Ralph Hertel, one with my uh, old colleague here in Poland, and I did three cases myself. So five cases of open bank art uh, repair, not much. Uh, and during this operation, the problem is to separate the capsule from the subscap, especially after many dislocations, because it's, it looks like a one tissue. But during this operation, when we sprayed, when we split this, the capsule from the subscap, in majority cases, we are grabbing the part of the insertion of the subscap together with the capsule. And maybe this is the answer of the question why after the open uh, bank card repair in the literature, we can find only 4% of uh, uh, radius location rate. Maybe this is the answer. We don't know. And there are some uh, papers uh, which were the, the background actually, the, the they build up the, the foundation of this, this technique. Uh, Nikola Sisak from uh, uh, Dubrovnik from Croatia, he described his uh, extra capsular suture, extra capsular technique. I was a very big fan of this. Uh, I started to do this technique, but uh, uh, unfortunately, I was disappointed with the limitation of external rotation. He just grabbed the uh, rotator interval together with the spear part of the subscap to limit the voluminity of the capsule. And this gives the, the stability, anterior stability, but do not avoid the uh, anterior inferior dislocation of the shoulder. So he stopped to do it, but the concept was smart. And then uh, after many investigation, after the uh, cadaveric work and uh, after uh, uh, ethical committee approvement, we did uh, some cases uh, and then I published uh, the technique. Uh, the indication on the beginning was quite uh, different than this, which I'm uh, used to use now, because uh, before 2012, we, uh, we were strongly used the IC score in this period. So we operated the patients uh, approximately about the five. Uh, then after the 2012, it was four. Now it's maybe three, maybe less. Uh, <clears throat> the name of the technique, it's, uh, it's an acronym from the uh, words between glenohumeral ligaments and subscapularis tendon. It was also the, the first plate in my first car. So maybe it was sentimental. Uh, <clears throat> the arthroscopic portals are uh, defined in the uh, literature before. It's an anterior superior portal and anterior classical portal. And this portal, it's uh, quite uh, unstable. It means uh, I move this portal from the top to the uh, low five o'clock position. Always keeping uh, in mind that the conjoint tendon is very close. So uh, under the control of the visualization, this portal is made. As the technique is one of the first uh, uh, image of the technique, you see this old vapor from, from uh, Jane Jay. Uh, the first, uh, um, we create the pouch classically, like we are in a normal bank art repair, up to the visual, visualize the uh, subscap uh, muscle. It's a glenoid rim. Uh, this is the uh, uh, MGHL. Then the second pouch is created in between the subscap and MGHL. 
exactly to the same place when we can uh, observe the, uh, the, the muscle of the subscap. A historical movie uh, showing the uh, first incision. So it's just a creation of the entrance for the uh, uh, CH pouch. And going ahead, we are continue this separation. The tendon together with the capsule maintains uh, intraarticularly, and then we are searching for the uh, tendinous cord inside the lower subscap. This is the final outcome. The lower part of the tendon is scorched to the capsule. And this is the uh, first uh, uh, version of the technique. Uh, as you can see, the uh, classical uh, maneuver from the bunker gripper, the labrum is elevated together with the capsule uh, from the posterior portal, then we are placing the suture. These are the quite historical movies but the quite uh, understandable shows uh, the meaning of the technique. Then we grab the threads, then we take it out uh, into the pouch. Uh, the sutures are placed, as you can see, a little bit on over the, uh, the uh, uh, labrum. Go on ahead. And the final, finally, it holds and you cannot find any threads here inside the joint because everything is extra capsular. That was the first option, first version. Then we start to use the uh, tendon cord from the uh, subscap. So we, we are trying to separate them. We did a cadaver study. We measured how often we can find the that robust tendon. And then we verify how far we are from the uh, danger structures. This is the axillary nerve. This is the tendinous cord, which are used to use for the BLS procedure. So we have uh, in the seven uh, cadavers, which we uh, dissect, it was always more than two centimeters from there. And the separation of the tendon, of course, doesn't look like that in, the, uh, in, the, uh, in life, but it's just to visualize how far we can go with this tendon and how large is this tendon. It's like ST. It's a very robust, very solidly defined tendon. It's not the, the flimsy tissue, it's a, it's a real tendon. Then, atroscopically, we can find it. We can isolate it. And here it's, it's with, uh, uh, with the magic grasper. Of course, it's not that... Uh, uh, let's say primitive now, uh, we are using now the, the much more uh, developed instrumentation to separate the tendon. I use the special Deschamp uh, uh, and the special uh, meniscal knife to, to separate uh, this, this tendon, but the movie uh, is, I, I think, very understandable. That's why uh, I like to show it. And this is the case with what I was asking. There is no capsule here. There is nothing on the anterior ring. That's why in these cases with the limited glenoid uh, erosion, uh, the insertion of the uh, lower part of the subscap can bring a good effect. And I think it's, it's for that. Uh, we also build the uh, anatomical model of the tendon uh, to try to check if it will not uh, um, bring the external rotation limitation. Uh, it, it doesn't happen. Uh, as you can see, it works separ separately. Uh, very easy to show in a, in a cadaver. It, it's very difficult to show in a, a life that there is no uh, external limitation because we always uh, are suturing the lower part of the capsule, the lower in, uh, inferior glenohumeral ligament. That's why uh, it, can, it can be problematic. And again, I, I would like to show you this, this movie. Uh, this is the, the boarding line, this is the cutting line for this uh, procedure. If we have this kind of flat line here, we cannot fulfill this gap with the subscap. This is a limit. If we have this kind of glenoid bonus. So that's it about the indication. And what to do when we have a heel sucks lesion. Uh, the heel sucks lesion, it's uh, the main problem for the stability, like in here, or like in here, I, I'm not sure if you can see it, 
because there are some screens here. Do you feel? Do you see the screens, or you 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 see the movie? Yeah, we are able yeah. to see. It. No problem. Ah, okay, that's good. And the, uh, what are the alternative made methods? Uh, I met with Marco Maiotti in 2011. He came to Bielsko and we discussed two days about his technique. Uh, we were working also together in the cadaver. And uh, this is, of, of course, this is the option. And what they asked me uh, if I use the, the subscar. Uh, I did uh, two operations on cadavers with the Maiotti techniques. Uh, I seen his article. I know that he is a big fan of that. I was speaking with the Ettore Taverna, who is applying this technique on over the, the, the bone graft to uh, bring some biomechanics for the bone grafting. Uh, in both cases, I had a severe, severe uh, limitation of external rotation. I don't want to have a, a external rotation limitation. They uh, explained that they push the patients for very active rehabilitation program just after the operation. And they explain that uh, we do not have this strong connection between the glenoid and uh, subscab later on, that uh, it brings some kind of scar tissue which connect the subscap with the anterior glenoid, but I'm, I'm not sure. I'm not sure, I will observe, I will wait. And also there is a nice uh, technique uh, described by uh, Oleg Milenin from Moscow, together with Bruno Toussaint. Uh, they describe the trans subscapular or transposition of the uh, LHB. Uh, seems to be nice technique, but still it brings a lot of threads in, inside the joint. I don't like a threads inside the joint. So that's why uh, uh, I believe that if we combine these two techniques, uh, DLS and ramp together, we can have some uh, better outcome. So the uh, meaning of ramp what it means ramp lissage. Ramp lissage is just fulfilling the uh, heel sacs lesion. It means it's changing the uh, intra-articular uh, lesion into the extra articular lesion. And then we are coming back for the question, what about the medial heel sacs? What for this kind of <clears throat> injury? For this kind of injury? Is it the, the place for ramp lissage for this kind of uh, heel sacs? Hmm. It's, it's really danger to answer yes, but we have to try to answer for whom we should apply the ramp lissage technique. For sure, there is a, a clear way to avoid the problem, it means it's bring the uh, capsule and the infraspinatus tendon not very close to the cartilage rim to avoid the external rotation limitation and to avoid the, the damage of the uh, capsule and the infraspinatus uh, due to the external rotation. For sure, it's changed the biomechanic. What it means is change biomechanic. The infraspinatus tendon it will work completely differently if he will be attached here or there when the humeral head will be rotated and uh, anteriorly pushed. The preparation and the surgical technique, uh, uh, it's very well documented. So I'm uh, actually uh, trying to use uh, this kind of uh, mechanical instruments. I don't like to use a burr. Uh, I'm trying to take out all the cartilage, remnants of the cartilage to make it really um, <clears throat> clear and, and as possible uh, bleeding uh, area here. Then the, the threads are placed uh, and the, in majority cases two anchors, uh, two metallic anchors. I believe that the metallic anchors will, will hold better here and the, the, the uh, uh, final effect is to fulfill the gap, uh, it's, it's known. Uh, <clears throat> Laurent Lafosse introduced the uh, Foley catheter uh, to make it easier and nicer. It means uh, you can put the, the Foley catheter in between the fascia of the deltoid and the infraspinatus, and then it's easier to find the threads. Uh, also, uh, you can define this space before you pass the threads. Uh, it means you, you jump out from the joint 
uh, you clean up this space, then you pass the suture, and you, you after the uh, on the end of the op uh, procedure, you you are just grabbing the threads. But with the foley, it's pleasant, it's quick. Uh, this is just a surgical tip. After the uh, uh, operation, uh, we're supposed to have we're supposed to have a, a stable joint. Uh, it means when we push the arm and uh, forward and we rotate externally. Uh, we should have a non-engaging uh, shoulder. Uh, not always looks like that, uh, but this is, this is actually our goal. We should not see the heel sacs lesion after this procedure. Even if we place the threads, if we place the anchor a little bit laterally from the uh, margin of the cartilage, we should not see the, uh, uh, the heel sacs after this procedure. Uh, some uh, practical aspects, uh, as I told, uh, completely different uh, uh, sharing of the of the forces after the remplissage. This is the biomechanical aspect. It's not only mechanical fulfilling the uh, uh, humeral bone loss. Uh, it's also the changement of the biomechanic of the infraspinatus. You see the way for the uh, intraarticular part of the uh, infraspinatus is much shorter than if uh, it's in, in his uh, anatomical uh, insertion position. Um, yeah. This is not nice photo. Actually, uh, this is the one of the biggest mistake. This is the rapture of the infraspinatus. There is not a clear heel sacs lesion, but there's the rupture. If we have the rupture of infraspinatus and we will try to make a, a rampy such procedure, then we, we are really risky to, to make a, a damage of the infraspinatus and, and we can lose this shoulder. So mm, this is not a nice picture. But still, the meaning, the meaning stays the same. I, even if we have the this rupture of the uh, insertion of the deep layer of the infraspinatus, we're supposed to think about the remplissage, uh, not like an isolated procedure, but first we have to uh, repair the infraspinatus and then make a remplissage procedure. Uh, it's gone ahead a little bit uh, forward about the indication. Here we had the explanation of the position of the heel sacs lesion, why it's so uh, a big difference in between the superior position and the uh, and the vertical position. Uh, some pictures uh, with a very uh, unstable joint with the bone loss on the anterior rim. Uh, so limited indication for the soft tissue procedure, but watch, there is a very nice MGHL. There is a uh, this rupture of the uh, uh, superior uh, labrum, it means it's a, a concomitant slap lesion. For this kind of patient, not very active, not very sportive, traumatic injury, let's say, maybe it's the indication. Uh, there is for sure no indication for uh, off-track uh, um, joint, and then uh, we discussed about that uh, previously. So I. I, I do not feel that there is a, any sense to place the uh, rampant such procedure for this situation. It doesn't make any sense. It will it will be destroyed uh, almost immediately, and it will even create some kind of uh, risky situation for the cartilage on the glenoid because it will destroy the cartilage on the uh, on the glenoid. Uh, yeah, this is the, the uh, uh, fragment of the article uh, from the G Di Giacomo uh, according the indication for, for the uh, remplissage procedure as well uh, for situation for bigger than 25%. I don't understand it. Actually, uh, I think it's supposed to be completely unversed for this kind of patients, remplissage and latage. It's very, very, uh, risky situation according to the early arthritis development. I did it. I had this kind of problem. Uh, I squeezed the joint after latage, remplissage. It's tying the joint. It compressed the joint. And these patients are super stable, but they can do anything because they are too stable. So uh, I, I, do not, I do not do this, this procedure any longer. And this is the algorithm, uh, uh, as I said uh, uh, before, and I think the, the, the borderline 
for off-track lesion uh, is when the glenoid loss is less than 20%. This is the indication for the uh, uh, bank arc repair plus reemplissage. And this is the group of the patients, maybe. We can discuss it. Uh, there, there's a lot of doubt about that. There is a lot of doubt about this uh, uh, static assessment of the joint because we have to think all of the time about the laxity. And we have to have in the, in the behind our head that always when we have the hyperlax patients and we apply the uh, reemplissage procedure, it's supposed to be done as close as possible to the lateral border of the insertion of the infraspinatus, not medial, because hyperlax patients, they will have the um, unlimited almost the external rotation and our reemplissage will be working on over the cartilage. It's danger for the cartilage. So think about it. Uh, <clears throat> these are these doubts, so I, I go a little bit farther. Uh, the glenoid uh, practically not injured, no glenoid bone loss, but there is completely no labrum on the anterior wall of this, of this joint. There's no labrum and the capsule is, let's say, practically unpresent. And watch this heel sax. This is the heel sax with a very sharp rim, but let's say it's almost on track uh, lesion. It's a big heel sax and the heel sax located inferiorly. It means for me, it's an ideal situation for the reemplissage. If we have this kind of heel sax lesion and we fulfill this posterior inferior aspect of the uh, heel sax with the infraspinatus and maybe even the teres minor, that will create the stability. Um, again, the same, uh, I will, I will go further because I would like to show you the, the outcome. This is the, uh, the group of patients which we uh, investigate in between the 2008 and 2011 was 36 patients with the, with the ballets. This is the group. Uh, the outcome was like that. Uh, we had the uh, unstatistical uh, limitation of the external and uh, either internal rotation. So looks that uh, uh, it's okay. We had the two uh, cases of uh, capsulitis and three cases of percent limitation of external rotation, more than 20%. More than 20%, it's too much. Okay. Till 20%, maybe, maybe it will not bring the uh, uh, osteoarthritis. More than 20%, it's too much. Uh, yeah. Is it work or not? Actually, there is more and more uh, scientific work trying to prove uh, some of them that it works, uh, some of them that it doesn't work, but we have to find probably our own uh, overview. Uh, is it, is it uh, uh, the method which can support our uh, practice or not? Uh, it's uh, nice work from 2014 made by Rashid. Uh, he did a meta-analysis uh, and in this, uh, this uh, meta-analysis looks that hmm, it's okay, it, it, it looks that it works, so why not? Uh, Garcia in 2016 uh, shown 11%, almost 12% of reduced location, uh, but also uh, there is a three traumatic uh, dislocation inside, so it means it's a uh, 6% of atraumatic redislocation. Unfortunately, this is the weak point of this job. And I think we have to wait much longer to, to make a, uh, an opinion if, if, if it's really uh, works or not. Uh, for throwing athletes, 65% complain of this uh, range of motion. Uh, and the throwing, it's not easy after this procedure. So we have to be conscious that this motion, uh, it's at risk uh, under this procedure. Uh, just a take home message. We have to treat uh, patients, not the pathology. No, no ramp research for these guys. Not at all. IC score, we can maybe, we can think about the, uh, 
the limit, the, the, the borderline somewhere in between like a Tomaso five points, but for this kind of patients, I, I will not recommend for sure the, the, the rent lissage uh, and the soft tissue procedure, not anymore. Uh, Geoffroy Nourissan shown that the three, three points in the IC score uh, should be dedicated uh, at least for, for this kind of surgery. Uh, once again, uh, this is my recommendation, my personal recommendation. Uh, if we have a, a patients from the borderline and we have this heel sucks lesion, but relatively small glenoid uh, bone loss, we have a good uh, anterior wall, uh, anterior structure. I think it's a place for BLS and remplissage, uh, but without the without the uh, severe glenoid bone loss for sure. Severe it means maybe more than ten percent, uh, and also we have to wait for the longer time follow up for uh, judgment uh, of the remplissage technique. Uh, I think uh, I will I will continue it. I'm quite satisfied for the patients with the limited glenoid bone loss. Uh, and let's hope, let's hope uh, it will bring something uh, important for the future. Uh, we have to keep the balance and we have to keep the proper uh, qualification for, for our patients. So thank you very much. Uh, on the end, I would like to invite you to, to visit my country. It's a few photos from my nearest uh, entertainment. Uh, we are living in a nice country. Uh, as, as you, uh, it's not that large, it's not that uh, um, big difference in between the south and north according to the climate, but still we have nice uh, places uh, to be seen and uh, for the holiday, I strongly invite you. And of course, uh, I would like to invite you for our next edition of, of our meeting in Krakow. I don't know where it will be, uh, actually when it will be, uh, we hope in October, 2021. Thank you very much. Thank you, Roman. Uh, I think you you made something very big revelation today. The new surgery in the armamentarium of shoulder surgeons, they have to learn, they have to know is BLS. <laughs> we, we knew about bank card, we knew about arthral target, we knew about uh, bone block. Now, uh, a new new kid on the roll that is BLS. How does, how does this subscapularis internal part will lead to... Uh, will not allow you uh, your shoulder to go out because it's a very very small tendon mm -hmm. actually it brings it brings the uh, all capsule together with this small tendon it means it's place a rule exactly the same uh, which is in normal joint place the mghl medial glenohumeral ligament it's keep the subscap in the proximity to the glenoid ring if we lost this connection the traction of the uh, muscle, it's weak. So it means that the subscap is not playing the role in stability any longer. It's a muscle coming from backward. And if it's not, if he is not reacting, the, the joint goes out. Okay. Any, any other question? Can I ask the question? Yes, yes. Go ahead. Uh, 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 Roman, it? excellent talk and a good day. Uh, as far as uh, we know, uh, the subscap actually, if it pulls, um, does it, will it not dislocate the humerus? Like, uh, if there is a strong subscap pull, will the humerus not translate anteriorly? So what you're, what you're essentially doing is not helping the subscap to uh, stabilize, but, but actually you're denoticing the subscap to the glenoid so that it actually doesn't uh, recruit in the abduction in the abduction external rotation position if the subscap uh, really contracts hard it, it will actually pull the humerus out of the socket won't it no i'm just asking you might have done some research on that like if i uh, to what i thought was if the infra was good if the infra was uh, uh, good and strong that would actually prevent and contract the subscap overactivity which can actually cause dislocation so your T notice is actually uh, uh, what I mean. Am, am I am I thinking right? That's my question. Yeah, actually, it's uh, uh, let's say it's an active tenodysis. disease. It's not made in a uh, neutral rotation. It's in external rotation. This is the first of all. 
The second, of, uh, yeah. we, we create some kind of uh, sling, some kind of tape. We scotch it together to the anterior inferior capsule, together with the inferior glenohumeral ligament. What it gives? It gives it every time when we rotate the arm in external rotation, we have a contracture, as you said, but with the lower part of the subscap. Superior part of the subscap, it works like it works before because it's not tenoid. Yeah. And yeah. the function of the subscap is completely preserved. We measure it uh, in a biodex system. We verified 10 patients, uh, we cannot. Uh, Yet we cannot uh, uh, publish it because uh, the, the problem is that uh, we did it uh, five years ago uh, and it's still unpublished. I'm sorry, uh, I'm sorry, but I'm afraid I have to go to the operating room uh, just to finish. Uh, we didn't publish it, but uh, we do not observe any uh, a weakening of the subscap after this procedure after half and one year after the operation. We didn't uh, examine the patients before because it's difficult. You, you know how the biodex is working. You have to really yeah, yeah. strong your work and it's too early. After three months, uh, it's too early to say to patients, you, you have to work on it. Uh, after half a year and one year, the comparison between the healthy side and the uh, operated side, no difference. It's small group, very small group. It's only 10 patients, but there is completely no difference in between the strength of the subscap. Uh, is technique on Vumedi? Have you put your tech, uh, video technique on uh, Vumedi or where can, where can we watch it? Is it on, published on the, in the journal? Uh, is it, is, it is published. It's published twice. It's published in uh, uh, techniques of the uh, uh, shoulder and elbow and it's published in the Kesta. And okay. I've sent to uh, Academy, uh, Eska Academy, uh, but I'm not. I cannot find this movie in the Eska Academy. So <laughs> don't <laughs> worry. We will. We will. We will popularize your technique in India. Don't yeah. worry. You will be your ambassadors. <laughs> first, first, uh, think about it. Uh, yes. If you agree with this concept or not, uh, and then. Uh, uh, if you if you are Roman, uh, I I've been always thinking about putting the knots outside the joint and uh, it was in fact uh, fantastic to see you do that so uh, i thought it would never be possible but you just showed that it is possible that itself is wonderful so you made us think that way that's really good thank you thank thank you thank you very much for your invitation i really have to go i'm sorry for that but i have to run to the operating thank, room thank you thank you roman for wonderful lectures that was a very new ideas and new concept thanks again we will get you involved again on ro rotator cuff maybe someday after the time we'll discuss with you thanks bye you too. Anytime. Yeah. So yeah you can yeah you can yeah. leave the meeting now we'll continue with some discussion thank you so I think uh, Roman has spoken about the new concept. Uh, I don't know how many of you are ready to digest the concept of uh, between the ligament subscapularis. Uh, Samir, Sanjay, Karthik, Rajkumar, uh, can you Subra. Roshan, sir. Yes, yes. Now, see, the, in, in the traditional open bank art, we always place the knots outside the joint. Yes. And uh, the, in arthroscopic bank art, we place the knots inside the joint. It is actually counterintuitive. When you want to stitch something up and tighten it, you have to place the knot outside only. So like in the rotator cuff, oh. if, you, if you think it is like placing the knot between the cuff and the footprint, uh, like what we are doing, what we are doing in bank art is like that. So what uh, Roman has shown us is exactly what we should be doing, but it's not practically possible. That's what uh, we used to think. Yes. But this is some this is given us a, a, a way for us to look into it. It's definitely a good uh, sort of uh, at least somebody has tried doing it, which is a good yeah. thing. Yes. I think we have, yeah, it's a good idea to uh, use this technique in ulcer type of lesion when we find the capsule quality is actually poor. Yes, totally agree. Uh, so Samir, you have uh, some cases to discuss, or we should uh, finish the meeting. Samir. You are mute. Unmute yourself. Unmute, unmute yourself, Samir. If time is there, we'll go ahead. Otherwise, yeah, next we, time. We'll yeah, we have we have ten minutes time, or no, we'll no, do it next time. No, no, no next. problem. Yeah, we'll we'll plan a complete uh, uh, panel right. discussion on bone sure. loss. Okay. Yeah? Okay. Thank you. Thank I'll. You.
I'll disconnect the live.